Have you ever played the couples question game? Where you take a number of different couples and one by or couple by couple, you have one of them leave the room. And of the other, you ask a number of rather personal questions. They may start off simply with things like, what's your favorite color? Or what's their favorite color? What's your favorite meal and what's their favorite meal? What's your favorite movie or what movie do they like? And there may be some other questions too that could get rather personal. Certain details that maybe most of us wouldn't know about the said individual. And so therefore what we do is we swap and that person leaves the room and then we bring in the spouse or the other half. And we ask those same questions. And try to understand, did the other person know precisely what their favourite meals and colours and these different things are? And oftentimes it's very interesting how we can see many couples can be quite in sync and both know each other really, really well. But sometimes there can be amusing or even embarrassing answers given. Because the reality is, I mean, the longer we do life together with other people, be it in friendships, in relationships and in marriages, we get to know the other person pretty well, don't we? The thing is, each and every single one of us have secrets. And we're often good at keeping secrets from other people, whether those secrets are kept from our neighbours, those who are our friends and family around us, even from our spouse. There are times that we may even deceive ourselves and our own hearts deceiving us. But when we move all these things aside, there is one person and one thing that cannot be deceived, and that is God and God's Word. Because as we come to study God's Word, we know that God knows our innermost thoughts. He knows everything that we're thinking. In fact, this is what Psalm 139 opens with. O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. It's kind of scary to think that God knows everything we're about to say and do. He knows our deep and darkest thoughts. He knows us. He created us. How can he not know that? But this is really the power of God, that he knows all these things. How do we know that? Well, it comes through God's Word as well, because God's Word tells us about himself, even as we've just read here in Hebrews and also that psalm, is that God knows us, He knows our thoughts, and His Word is one way that He speaks to us. It is a means by which He convicts us of our sin, He challenges us, He, he directs our paths. And this is where God's Word, and within the context of what we're seeing here, needs to be heeded. Within the context of this passage, it actually comes off the back of a warning. That warning came from the nation of Israel when they were in the wilderness, having come out of Egypt, preparing to go into their promised land. They didn't enter the promised land at that time because of a stubborn, disobedient heart. They didn't enter in because of disobedience. So God's word fell on disobedient hearts and ears in the wilderness. But this is the warning. We shouldn't let that same thing happen to us that we need to unblock our ears and hear it, because if we are to enter God's rest, we need to know God's Word, we need to study God's Word, we need to heed God's Word so that we know how it is that we can take it seriously. In fact, we read this back in chapter 2, verse 1, is that we need to pay even closer attention to what we have heard. Because not only do we have God's Word through the Old Testament, through the prophets and so on, the Word has come to us now through Jesus Christ, God's Son. We need to hear what He has to say. He is the Word and we also have God's written Word and we need to pay careful attention to it. So what does the Bible then reveal of itself? How do we understand this written Word of God? Well, in fact, the Bible tells us a lot about itself and we could do a massive survey through all the Scriptures that explain it for us. But by way of summary, a lot of theologians catalogue these into some common words. You've heard these before, that we know the Word of God is inspired. It is inerrant. It is infallible. The Word of God is authoritative. It is sufficient. It is reliable. 
And the Word of God is necessary, necessary for our own salvation. This morning, therefore, as we look at these verses here in Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13, what I'd like us to see is broadly two things. We can see, firstly, what God's Word is, and secondly, what God's Word does. Let's begin with the first, what the Bible is. And we see this in verse 12, at the start of verse 12 here, for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Just in that statement here, we have four very powerful things being stated about what God's Word is, what the Bible is to us. The first of these is that it is divine. It is the Word of God. It is not the wisdom of man or any fables or stories. This is God's Word to us. It is divine. It is inspired. In 2 Peter 1.21, the Apostle Peter says that no prophecy was produced by the will of man, but men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And what they spoke was also written down for us. And in 2 Timothy 3.16, we see that all Scripture is breathed out by God. It is inspired by God. This is all Scripture from Genesis through to Malachi, from Matthew through to Revelation. Every single word, every paragraph, every jot, every tittle, every I dotted, every T crossed, every single character and symbol, everything in God's Word is inspired. It is reliable, it is infallible, it is inerrant, it is the inspired Word of God, it is authoritative in our lives because it is God's Word to us. It is inspired. J.C. Ryle once said, a partially inspired Bible is little better than no Bible at all. Because we need to know God's Word and trust that every single word on its pages speaks to us. It is reliable and it comes from God. Now, God being divine and God therefore being eternal means that His Word also is eternal. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says that the grass withers, the flower fades... But the word of our God will stand forever. Not one word will pass away. And this is why we can trust God's word. It is God's word to us. It is divine. But secondly, we see that God's word is living. You know, we can read many books through our lives. Many of us are quite good bookworms. We read book after book. Most of us have read at least one book cover to cover, surely. But the thing is, we can read books and we can read the Bible, but of all the books in the world, the Bible is the only book that reads us. God's Word is alive, it is living, and it reads us as we are reading it. Numerous theologians have spoken on this over the years, and two famous quotes come from none other than the first being Martin Luther, and he said that the Bible is alive, it speaks to me. It has feet, it runs after me, it has hands, it lays hold of me. The other comes from Spurgeon, and I'll paraphrase this one. More broadly, he's saying that the Bible has wrestled with me, it has smitten me, it has comforted me, it has smiled on me, and it has frowned on me. It has clasped my hand and warmed my heart. It weeps with me, sings with me, whispers to me, and it preaches to me. Because of all the books in the world, there is one book that is always relevant, and that's the Word of God. It is relevant yesterday, it's relevant today, it will be relevant tomorrow. It is timeless. Because the Word of God, it speaks to every man, in every place in the world, and at every time. It is relevant. We do not need to see this as a past book that only speaks of events in Israel's history way back in the Old Testament or at the time of Jesus as he was on earth. It's not a past book, but it's something that is active. It's alive. It speaks to us today. And as we read it, it reads us. Because these are attributes that we'll see of God's Word, whereas it puts us under the microscope. It convicts us and it challenges us because it is alive. You may know of the French historian, writer, and philosopher Voltaire. 
He was famous for his venomous railings against Christians and Christianity and against the Bible. And he famously once said that in a hundred years, the, the Bible will become irrelevant, that it will pass from common use. Well, the question is, how many of you today have any of Voltaire's books in your home? How many people read Voltaire today? Yet the Word of God come time and time again under attack, people wanting to destroy it, burn it, pass it from existence, have failed to achieve that time and time again. Voltaire, interestingly, after his death, his house was used for the storage of Bibles and of gospel and religious tracts. Some have tried to discredit that from history, but they've actually found this to be true. The person that railed against the Bible said that it is going to pass from common use. His house was ending up being used to store this. Because God's word, you can never squash it, you can never burn it, you can never pass it from existence. It is alive and it will outlast every other book that there is. The word of God is not only divine, it's not only living, it is also active. The word active here is energes, which is where we get the word energy. Another way of saying it is that the Word of God is effective. It is able to accomplish a specific task for which it is intended or to produce an intended result. And so with the Word of God being living and active, there is not a single dead word. There is not a single dead threat or promise that's given. Everything is real and it will come to pass as God has said. It is living and it is active and it will accomplish his purposes. We know this famous verse from Isaiah 55, 11, that God's word shall not return to him empty. It shall accomplish that which he purposes. God has spoken it, it comes with power, it's alive and it will accomplish its intended result. When the Bible speaks of life, it brings life. When the Bible speaks of judgment, it condemns. When the Bible speaks encouragement, it brings joy. And when it gives its promises, it also brings us hope. Because the Bible speaks to every situation, to every person through all of history, it is living, it is alive. But my question to you is, then, if the Bible is divine, if it is the Word of God, if the Bible is living, if it is active, how often do you read it? Is the Bible something that you only ever open on a Sunday? Perhaps we just look at a few verses at a time and then you close it and it stays on the shelf for the rest of the week? Or is it something that you open occasionally? Or is it something that you open and read daily? Because this is the command that we have to know God's Word and to study it, because this is God's Word to us. Because also, too, as we go through this life, we go through all its ups and downs, the joys, of course, that's always nice, but when we go through trial and hardship, too, God's Word encourages us through all of those times, the good seasons, the bad seasons, when things are going great and when we need help and encouragement. And that is why God's Word is so important. It is our lifeline. It is alive. It is God's Word to us. And we need to read it, to understand it, to apply it to our lives and put it into practice. Because not only is God's Word divine, living and active, that we need it, it is also sharp. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. If you think throughout history, there have been all manner of swords. You've got broad swords, long swords, curved swords, you've got daggers, and all manners of different knives and so on. And at the time that this book was written, there were probably two main swords that were quite common in use. First, there was the Roman broadsword. It was big and it was heavy. But the type of sword that we're speaking of here was a short sword. It was perhaps only about 18 to 24 inches in length. It was short and it was double-edged. It was like a small sword or like a dagger. It was used for up-close combat, for cutting, for thrusting, and it was a deadly weapon in the right hands. And this is what God's Word is. It is a deadly weapon. 
It's used for cutting and it's used for stabbing. And this is where, too, when it comes to the Word of God, we need to look at this in light of even the Gospel. Because there are many today that want to blunt that sword. They want to just remove any conversation about sin and judgment. And they don't want to speak of those things or even let alone hell. And many pulpits and many voices are silent because they don't want to go there. No, let's instead, let's speak of love and of niceness. Let's make the gospel all about having health, wealth and happiness. Or in recent years too, we've seen a shift towards more of a social gospel as well. Let's end world problems. Let's bring peace and justice and taking little verses to support these different phrases and so on. And what we end up doing is trying to shave off the sharp edges of God's word. The thing is, we don't need to do so. God's Word is powerful. In fact, John, in his Gospel at the end, in chapter 20, verse 31, he actually wrote that these things are written so that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and in believing, you might have life in His name. Because what we need to do when it comes to the Word of God is just unsheath it, to wield it powerfully, because God's Word is sharp. It cuts where it needs to cut. It will will, pierce where it's pointed because it is sharp, it is powerful. And this is where we come then to what God's Word does. See, in the latter half of verse 12 here, it pierces to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Often, too, throughout history, there are many people that have railed at the Bible, And what Spurgeon famously once said too is, if you hear a man railing at the Bible, you can usually conclude that he's never read it. Isn't that the case? There are many people that say, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions, or it's full of this, or it's full of that, and so on. But if you really ask the question, well, show me. You will find that 99 out of 100 times, they haven't even picked it up and read it. Many of those people want to suppress God's Word because it is a powerful weapon. It is the most powerful weapon that there is. It convicts, it challenges, it's sharp, and it does something very powerful. And it is the most powerful weapon in the world in that it has brought the hardest of sinners down. It is pierced, it is split asunder, it is broken apart the hardest of hearts. It has converted the harshest of sinners and has turned them into blubbering messes before God when their hearts are exposed, when their sin and their wickedness is exposed before a holy God. Because God's Word is divine, it is living, it is active, it is sharp. And so here we see what it does. And this is the first, is that the Bible pierces. It's a penetrating word. It overcomes any resistance. It is going to cut through the hardest of hearts. God's Word is sharp. It cuts where it's going to land, where it connects. It also pierces where it points, because that is why we just unsheath God's Word and let it speak, let it do its job. You may remember from your reading of Acts, and in Acts 2, following the day of Pentecost, that Peter stood up and addressed the crowd, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is where God's Word becomes powerful, when it's accompanied by His Spirit. And He stood up, and He gave them the Gospel. And He told them and showed them what they had done to their Messiah, Jesus Christ, who'd been sent to them, who died for them. And He gave them the pure, unadulterated Gospel. And before He even finished, they they were cut to the heart, as Acts 2 says. What must we do to be saved? And that's all it takes, just unsheath the sword and speak, and it cuts through to the heart. Spurgeon once said too, and this is famously observed, and again a paraphrase of a broader series of sermons where the same thought kept coming out and out again. He said that the Word of God is like a lion. You don't need to defend a lion. Just let it out of its cage and it will defend itself. We don't need to shave off any of those harsh truths of the Scripture. We don't need to put aside discussions of sin and judgment or even hell. Because God's Word, whilst it also will convict and condemn, it also encourages, it brings life 
because it's got all these words of promise through who God is, what He has done for us. Just let God's Word do that and it will pierce through to the heart. Not only does it pierce, it also divides. We see the separation here of two pairs of things. First, we've got soul and spirit and secondly, of joints and marrow. The first of these we could say is that it's a psychological weapon. It cuts through to the immaterial part of a person, able to divide now the soul from the spirit. What is the soul? It's the immaterial part of each and every one of us. It's the seat of our thoughts, our will, our emotions. It is what makes up a person. But then we have the spirit, the other side of a person that speaks then of our relationship to God. How is your spirit and your relationship with God? Because when we test that, when God's word tests that, we see a testing of our faith for him, toward him, our love for him. It speaks of our perseverance and of our character. Because the word of God is able to divide between these things and show how our relationship with God perhaps might even be mismatched from our thoughts, our will and our intentions. It'll divide between the two. But not only is it perhaps used in a psychological way, but also a physiological way, a separation of joints and of marrow. Now, we know that the joints and the marrow aren't necessarily connected. It's not like a scientific breakdown of the anatomy of the body. But when we think of joints, we're talking about the connections now between the bones, that the Word of God is able to sever limb from limb. But also getting through to the marrow, it speaks of the fatty tissue that's within the bones themselves. And oftentimes, too, that the marrow is considered as being the innermost part of a person. And when we put these together, we see that God's Word divides. It's not a psychological weapon. It's not even a physiological weapon. It's a powerful weapon. It can be used to accomplish anything that God intends for it to accomplish. It cuts through to the heart. It cuts us from top to bottom and from side to side, and it lays everything open and exposed to God. And that is what scares us so much, which is why many don't want to open God's Word. They don't want to read it. They would rather uh, speak against it and have it closed or burned or put away with because it is the thing that convicts and challenges. It divides. And it is able, therefore, to discern. This is where it gets really scary. The Word of God is discerning. The word here is kritikos. It's where we get that word critical, critical thinking, because it goes and puts us under careful evaluation and judgment according to God's Word. And it shows us how unholy and how unrighteous we are when we compare ourselves to a holy and a perfectly righteous God. It will discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is for everything within us. It begins with our thoughts. All those things that you think that you can hide from others, that you hide from those around you, that you would hide from your friends, you would even hide from your spouse. And perhaps you may even in your conscience try and squish that down and pretend it doesn't exist. But God's Word will bring that to the surface. It will uncover it. It will expose the thoughts and then going deeper down to even the intentions of the heart. It will discern all of your emotions, your desires, and everything that is contrary to God's Word. It will bring it to the surface. Those things around our own psyche, if you take all of that together, our hearts and our desires will flow out into what we think and what we say and also what we do. And the Word will cut and divide and discern deep within our hearts. And it rips us right open. The problem is... We think too highly of ourselves. Do you honestly really think that you're able to discern accurately or that you're properly equipped to be able to discern your own thoughts, your intentions and your motives? The reality is you think of yourself way, way much better than you really, really are. We saw this back in Hebrews 3, verse 12, is the deceitfulness of our own sin. And this is the hardness of heart of even those people in the wilderness and the call to us today not to be 
uh, not to succumb to the hardness of our own hearts and the deceitfulness of sin. Because as we read also in Jeremiah 17, 9, is that the heart is deceitful above all else. And I don't mean this to sound critical or judgmental, but as your pastor, I could exhort you time and time again as to why you need to read God's Word, why you need to pray without ceasing, why you need to be at church as much as possible, why you need to be going to Bible studies or any other type of exhortation. The reality is, however, you've already determined in your own heart as to why you should listen to or not listen to what I say. And this just goes with the territory. This is really just exposing the deceitfulness of our own hearts because we will justify why those rules apply to someone else. And I've got reasons or excuses as to why maybe I need to sleep in or not go to church or I don't have time to read my Bible. I've got other things on my plate. It just shows us the deceitfulness of our own hearts is that we, deep down, are all depraved. We will do what's right in our own hearts. We will please ourselves because we are living then in contrary to what God's Word says. Again, remember what the psalmist says in Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. God knows all the different things that none of us really think that we want to expose or share with other people, but God does. And this is where we come down to now the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. Because Scripture is powerful to save, it is powerful to sanctify, it is power to strengthen, it is also powerful to sustain. This Word of God not only convicts you of your sin, but it also brings encouragement to your life and enables you to live the Christian life. Will you fail? Will you sin against God? Absolutely. Will you be deceitful in your own heart? Absolutely. But this is why we need to be in God's Word, that He'll help to expose those things in our heart by the power of His Holy Spirit working in us. He exposes those things so that we can repent of those things, turn to God and live a life that is pleasing to Him. And this is the sufficiency of Scripture. We need to know God's Word. We need to read it and have it apply to ourselves. Whether a non-Christian or a Christian, this is a powerful Word of God. It pierces, it divides, it discerns, but also, fourthly, it also exposes. Verse 13, And no creature is hidden from His sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. This is perhaps another way of saying you can run, but you can't hide. Every single one of us will have to stand before God and give an account. The question is, how? Now, the words here, it's interesting that these two words here are used are that we're all but naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The word naked here is gymnos. It's where we get the word gymnasium. Many athletes of the time, and in fact, if you even were to look at the origins of the Olympic Games, athletes competed naked, which is why it was no women allowed, no women sports or spectators, this was for the men, but they were were naked because clothing would be seen to inhibit one's ability. But the thing is, nakedness, as we know, has always been used to speak of one's shame. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was also stripped naked because it is a shameful thing for someone to be exposed. But this is just like an athlete or whatever, but just this nakedness means everything will be removed. When you stand before God's Word and you open it and read it, one day when you stand before Him him to give an account, you will be naked. There's nothing you can hide behind to clothe your nakedness, your shame, your sin, you will be exposed. Everything is exposed before God. But also not only naked, it is also exposed. Now the word here is used in one sense also in terms of sport. When one man overpowers another and he either holds the person by their neck or puts his foot on that person's neck in submission, that is one aspect of this. But the word here is where we actually get the word today, tracheotomy. 
It speaks of a person so gripped by the word of God that their head is snapped back and their neck is exposed ready for the knife of a sacrifice that's about to be made, cut from the left to the right, a slaughter. And this is really the power of God's word, that sharp word that just exposes like a tracheotomy. And this is where it says here that we are all naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. In the book of Daniel, we've got a picture of this uh, standing before the throne of God. In Daniel chapter 7, we read, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. You know, God holds a record of account for every action, every word, every thought, and these are written in the books. This is paralleled for us in Revelation chapter 20 when we come to the great white throne judgment. God Almighty will be seated on the throne. Revelation says that earth and sky will flee from before him. There is no place found for them. And all of the dead, both great and small, will stand before him and the books will be opened. All of those books that contain records of everything a person has said, thought and done. And each person will be judged in accordance with the things written in those books. If you were to stand before God now and the record of your life was on full display, do you think, considering the deceitfulness of your own heart, that there is enough good in you that you've done in your life that you could stand before God for those events, of all those secret things in your heart that even your wife and your closest of friends don't know, but all of these are exposed before God, do you think that you would get a pass mark? If that happened today, how would you go? Because that is the standard by which each and every one of us would otherwise be judged when the Word of God exposes our hearts. What it does, it it takes that big, sharp knife And it will cut you open from top to bottom, from left to right. It will expose your heart. And the Word of God says, yuck. Because your sin is horrid. It's putrid before a holy God. But there is hope. Because you could stand before God to give an account for those things. And you will never, ever earn enough righteousness to get a pass mark to find your way into heaven. But that's where Christ stepped into history. In Romans chapter 5... We know that while we were helpless, while we were still sinners, while we were enemies and estranged from God, he sent his son Jesus to die for us. That if we place our faith in him, that wrath of God that should have been placed upon us for our sins was placed on Christ and he paid the price in full. When he hung on that cross and he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. It is an accounting term that says paid in full. He paid the full price for your sins. It means that that account of those records are blotted out. As the scriptures say, as far as the east is from the west, your sins will be removed from you and your name will appear in another book, as Revelation 20 says, the book of life. Because if your name is found in that book, that record of everything that you've done is erased. It's passed away. And that's what the Scriptures do, that's what the Word of God does, it exposes us, it should break us. We should see ourselves and think, I am never going to be good enough, I am worthy of judgment, why does God not kill me right now? Because every waking moment, every single thought is in rebellion against Him. But because of the grace of Christ, because of everything that He has done for us, it also, this Word, this same Word brings us hope. It exposes our hearts, but it is intended that it turns us toward Him. And that is the book of life of which your name needs to be written into if you are to pass into heaven. And this is why we see God's powerful Word as such an important thing. It is the sharpest, most powerful weapon you could ever wield. 
You just need to remove it from its scabbard. When you read it, it reads you, but it challenges you in a good way. God exposes the sin in your own heart so that you can come to him in repentance. That you can thank God for the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for your sins. It's a free gift. We just have to accept it and God will blot away those sins. We can keep coming to his throne of grace and we will look at that more as we pass through this book of Hebrews together. But in your Christian walk, you need to know this word. Which is why, like I said, I could encourage you week after week to be in the Word, but even too, you need to cut through the deceitfulness of your own heart and the weakness of your own flesh and open it each and every day. Read it continually. Be continuous and constant in prayer. Spend as much time with Christians as you can for the encouragement that we need to do that. And when it comes to sharing the Gospel as well, we don't need to dumb it down. We don't need to water it down to not speak about sin and judgment. We need to know these things because no person, if they're not convicted of their sin, they won't even have a chance to hear the good news of the gospel. We first need condemnation before there's actually hope. And which is why the Bible is the strongest, most powerful weapon there is. Put down all other blades. Pull this one from its scabbard. Wield it strongly, wield it confidently, and to do so, you need to be in it each and every day. Break through the deceitfulness of your sin, because remember, in the context of this, speaking of the hardness of the hearts of those that had their ears closed to the Word of God, they perished in the wilderness. And that is the the fast-forwarding to today. What the Holy Spirit says today is, today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart as in the rebellion. Let your heart be cut asunder by the Word of God. Let it expose the inside so that you can come to the cross in grace. Because we need to take this Word seriously if we are to enter His rest. We need to read God's Word. We need to know God's Word. We need to understand God's Word. We also need to heed God's Word because it is the most powerful weapon that there is, but is also the grace by which God has given us the good news of Jesus Christ, which we will look at next time as being him as our great high priest. Let's close in prayer. We thank you, our dear Heavenly Father, for your word, this powerful weapon. Lord, we appreciate what your word is, but also it really is a challenge to us when we see what it does. Whilst we do not like the fact that all things are exposed, even those deep, dark secrets and thoughts, Lord, we know that they're wicked. But Lord, we pray that you would give us the boldness and the humility to see our sins exposed before you, but that we can come to the cross. We can thank Christ for all that he has done for us and come to him and his saving faith that is available to each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, for your word. And we pray, Lord, too, that you would encourage us each and every day to open it to read it, to have your Holy Spirit teach us from it, convict us, challenge us, and to train us in all unrighteousness, that the lives that we live would be to the glory and the honour of your name. We thank you for your powerful word at work in each of our everyday lives. And for these things we ask and give you thanks and praise and ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.